OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. So um, welcome to Who Wants to Engage with Technology. This is more of a, who wants to get engaged with technology? <laughs> but most of our teachers are like, who wants to engage with technology? So we're, um, we are Triple M, I'm Maricel, that's Michael, and Michelle is online. Say hi, Michelle. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to, um, we're going to present together, and we're from Eastside Adult Education, that's somewhere in San Jose, and <laughs> we just have a few questions. What did I do? There we go. We have a few questions for you to think about because um, we are actually going to ask you for help with how you would have your teachers engage with technology. Um, we're kind of struggling with that. Well, we're kind of challenged by that right now. So our situation is, and I'm going to switch this, but it'll come back at the end. Here's our situation. We have lots of technology. We have a, a hover cam. We have a projector that allows us to touch the screen. Um, we have Chromebooks, we have Chrome carts, we have computer labs. Um, we have lots of software, learning software that our admin provides us, but um, we are met with resistance to use the technology in the classroom with our students. And that's resistance from teachers rather than administration. So, one of the things that you guys are going to do, and also for you online, if you want to put your answer in the chat, just a quick good morning activity. Um, let's pretend that you attended our training last week. We taught you how to set this up. And so I would be asking you, I would ask you to set this up. So I'd say you attended training last week. We did an hour on this. So here are the uh, here are the materials. Set this up. What would you do? Well, it looks like something needs to be plugged into the USB. Okay. What's the next step? Power button. Okay. It doesn't work. What's the next step? What do you do next? Check to make sure your uh, device is plugged in. Okay, should be plugged in. Anyone in online want to add their thoughts or what they would do in the chat would be great. But everyone else in person, everything's plugged in, it seems like. Well, the, the, that thing is not plugged into the computer. Right. Yeah, the USB. This yeah. thing you have to set up. What do you, yes, sir. Put in a ticket. I would call me because that's why you're not attending. But you got a chat. Okay. Uh, let's see. The, the chat says, look at the resources or steps from the presentation last week. That's uh, what they uh, contributed that. Awesome. Perfect. Does anyone else have? Well, I want to know what that white thing. Oh, uh, gonna... <laughs> this is new technology. Brand new technology. So somehow that has to be hooked into the computer. Yes. But the thing is, they should have told me in the training that I had uh -huh. what this is and what purpose it serves. And I hope that that would have been part of the training. Yes. Yes. We're assuming that it was part of the okay. training. But we don't know because we weren't part of the training. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true well i'll give you a hint when it when plugged in correctly um it will light up mm. well i i think that i um, i will take out my cell phone and look at the video that i made from <laughs> before okay wrong. So that's what the students do right very great answers, great answers. I'm so glad you're here to participate in that because you are showing, uh-oh. There we go. You are showing the persistence that we need teachers to show when we are dealing with new technology. And as you can see, 
it actually plugs into the keyboard <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it lights up. What purpose does this serve? It, it makes people happy. So um, that is the successful problem solving that you have showed. Um, you are able to step back and look at the situation, look at the video, look at the notes, look at the manual, um, resort to looking at other sources for the solution, and you have the curiosity to try it at different angles. So you are great. You are successful problem solvers. But what about the teachers who don't demonstrate these qualities, who are given the material and is like, oh, I remember this from last week, but I forgot what to do. So um, we need what we need to do for our teachers, and this is one thing that we're discussing for our DLAC project to help teachers become successful with technology is performance support. And perform does anyone know what performance support is? First of all, um, is it giving you advice on how you do something like peer review? No, no well. It can be, it can be. Is it like being there for when the person is performing the activity exactly. to encourage them or give them a little bit of help when they need it? Right, right. Michael, were you gonna say something? Well, that sounds good, yeah. Okay. At least what we want to be able to provide to our teachers and we don't always have the people available to do it. Right. I think. Right, so performance support, exactly what you mentioned. I didn't catch your name. I'm Adriana. Adriana, exactly what Adriana mentioned, where you support the teachers or you support someone right then and there um, as they need you for what they need you. So like just right now, if, if I were making this, um, if I had this, I would probably go with very solution, solution, which was go to the video I made or recorded on how to set this up. And so um, we do need to have some sort of performance support because old habits, teachers will revert to, well, I shouldn't generalize, but we all go back to the thing that we remember how to do easiest. And the, the reason why we need performance support is because it's easy access. It's not like, oh, let me put in a ticket and I'll come get back to you a week later. It's right then, right there, now. And does anyone have that availability in their adult school at the moment? Or do you know of schools that have that? That's what I was just going to ask. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. There's a chat, I think. Yeah. Um, fortunately, in uh, our adult division in uh, Los Angeles Unified, we do have positions. Uh, we have two types of support. We have people who are called um, information technology support technicians, and they're the people like if you have a problem with the board, mm -hmm. or the, the, the owl is not talking to the board, they do all the technical stuff if you have a problem with the network. But my position is actually called instructional. Uh, technology teacher advisor and our role is support for um instructional needs for the teacher so there's we're fortunate we, we have one in uh, all of the main campuses so while it may not be exactly 10 you know within the next 10 minutes we do have the capability to respond in different ways fairly quickly for the teacher you know walkie talkie goes on and says you know so and so, and you know, room to go to, you know, is having a problem with their school issue. Mm -hmm. We can actually pretty much get over there, but we do recognize that not all districts have that. Mm -hmm. So, is that a full time position? Yeah. Or? It is. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, I was going to say something about old habit because in the moment when this, and again, you know, I'm looking at classrooms. Uh, of classrooms of students. We don't necessarily work in that, that situation now. But when there were a, there was a classroom of students, the technology is not working. No matter what technology it was, computers, overhead projector, anything that's not working, the old habit is the teacher says, I already know how to do this. I'm just going to do it because they're worried about losing the students. Right. 
So that's a, you know that's why we go that's why we go back so quickly to old habits. Do you mean unless like, we have that kind of support where right. we can call somebody and they'll be there right away. And by old habits, I mean I do this myself, and I like technology. I'm embracing it and I use it, but often I want to stand in front of the board with my chalk or my white marker or whatever. Turn back to the books. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm one who actually likes the stuff. So That's a lot the of other teachers yeah. 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 completely push it to the side. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. Totally agree, Adriana. And that's we we do go back to the old habits because it's simple. Sometimes it's it's simple for us because we've been doing it and we know exactly what to do. I think there still is some room for that though. Yeah. I mean, at times is at least it mean, depends on the situation and the skill level of the teacher. Right. But in adult ed, I think the teachers still or the students sometimes they don't mind a little the old fashioned approach. Right. We don't want to lose the students. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, Jose says steps or guidance on how to meet the expected outcome. Perfect. Thank you, Jose. Uh, one of the things that performance support absolutely must be is it has to be in bite-sized pieces. So think of this scenario. If you had a flat tire and you were on the side of the road and you really needed to get somewhere, um, would you look at a three minute video of how to change your flat tire or a 15 minute video? I would call AAA. <laughs> third option, third option. Very, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's also what we do in our job. <laughs> you know, somebody asks us about something, we we can quickly look it up on Google mm -hmm. before we go out there. To, yeah. Everybody uses that Google tool. Yeah. And they're usually bite-sized because, like you said, you don't want to lose the students. If you, excuse me, if you are there looking at a video for 15 minutes, what are your students doing during that time? Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that instruction continues. And, you know, the third bullet is that the admin will usually change. Um, for our schools, we have a turnaround. Um, our administration usually, like, comes and goes. So we have changes off, not too often, but, um, you know, the... Performance support will help support the teachers. It will help them pick up skills so that they keep those skills even as admin changes. Even if right now we have a supportive admin who gives us all the technology we need, but maybe down the line, maybe we won't be so lucky. So we need to be able to support the teachers that way um, as they change. Am I pressing the right? Maybe one more thing on bite-sized yes. pieces, just to, since you brought it up. Sometimes I try to make some training videos. I'm right now I'm trying to help some of the teachers with Canvas. And it's a real skill to actually make a bite-sized video. <laughs> you see it record and all of a sudden you're at three, four minutes. And so I totally agree, but it that's a whole nother part of the proposal. All righty, and, and how do we do performance support? Well, we support their knowledge, so training. Um, we support their skills, maybe follow-up, hands-on things. And then we change their attitudes. So if you look at KSA, attitude, the A part could also be ability, but for our specific needs, um, it would be an attitude. So our teachers' attitudes would have to change toward technology. Um, one way that we were going to uh, support the teachers' KSAs after training was to have um, po possibly YouTube videos. Uh, it's easily accessible from any device. You don't need a specific account in order to access it. Um, you do get ads though, but the the trait like most people would need training on how to do YouTube, and then that's it. Just uh, look through some video files and see which one you need. Watch that for three minutes, and hopefully that will support you in that time and that need. Um, and then I think that's it for my part. Right. So my question for you is, is there a way that for you as adult ed um, educators, how have you supported your teachers through KSA?
One of the things that I was thinking of, and you know, I have to go back a few years, but one of the things that I was thinking of when we started having checks on campus um, in the evening for our teachers um, is that um, the tech and I spoke uh, after a couple of those first evenings and the tech said, you know, most of the time they need me, it's because something isn't plugged in. So, <laughs> And I, you probably deal with this as well, Barry, or probably have dealt with this as well. So what we did to support their knowledge is we said, okay, to support the tech and to support the teacher, what are some of the things that we can do to have the teacher check before the, they call the tech? So, you know, make sure it's plugged in, you know, uh, you know, make sure the monitor's turned on, make, you know, whatever first steps there were, maybe three, not a lot. Mm -hmm. but maybe three things that they needed to do before they called that tech. And that would support their knowledge because they then they know what to do. And then and then once they have that foundation, then you can ask them to do a couple more things. And that's supporting their knowledge and their skills. Right. And mm -hmm. their attitude because they could solve the problem by themselves. <laughs> yes. Bite size, bite size. I don't... Maricel simulation makes even more sense now. <laughs> 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 All right. So tech, uh, what question, when you had a tech, was it a classified position or certified? Or? Yeah, classified. Okay. It was a classified position, mm -hmm. right? But yes. And were they up to speed with like something like Google Classroom or Google Suite or whatever was being used? They at were the up time? to speed with the technology that we were using at the time. And actually, we were really fortunate that uh, we used to have like random techs. Uh, hired by each of the schools. And what the district decided to do was create a standard for all of the techs across all of the schools. So they had to pass a test to know, you know, Microsoft, they had to know, you know, uh, PCs, they had to know Apple products, they had to know a variety of things. They need to have a minimum threshold to yeah. pass that test, and then they could, you know, be interviewed. Exactly. We get a little bit of resistance to hiring a the new full-time person. We don't really have many classified techs. We have no paraeducators. And so all, most of our in-house training or support is at the full certified rate. And mm -hmm. So then when we propose, well, maybe we need someone at, you know, every morning and every evening in the computer lab or something, then there's yeah. a little resistance to creating a position. Well, that's, yeah, that's the leadership and seeing mm -hmm. how that might work, yeah. We have something in the chat. There's a chat from Jose. Okay, so Jose says we curated a list of short videos from YouTube ha -ha, on how to complete specific tasks across different programs. The list was housed in an app accessible by phone or PC. Awesome. Jose, I think we're on the same page. I think maybe we're on the same page. With you. What's that? Maybe he could share his short videos from YouTube. So yeah. Or the name of the app. Or yeah. the name of the yeah. app. Jose, if you could do that for us, that'd be great. If you could like add that in the chat, we totally look into it. Yes, sir. So um, when it comes to attitudes, um, you know, the teachers, I think, first need to get the buy-in uh, to why why using the technology is important for their what they're trying to teach. Mm -hmm. um, and so that to me, that's always been like a, a, a two-edged sword or a two parts of a big problem, which is, you know, you can they can go to a conference and they can see all this great technology, they get excited, and then they get back to the campus and that technology doesn't exist for them yet. And so maybe there, there's a waiting period of a month or six months or never <laughs> where they'll never get that equipment. You know, so the, the enthusiasm for using the technology sometimes uh, isn't there. Mm -hmm. So on the other hand, administrators and other people sometimes will purchase lots of things and then the teachers don't really know how to use them. And they sit. So I'm sure everybody's been at a campus where you have a, a beautiful computer screen or a, a smart board or Promethean board, and it's just sitting in the back of the room. Yeah, I mean, dust. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, those things work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to have the enthusiasm, but you also have to have the equipment. And if that's not in sync, 
then the attitude uh, decreases. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this one thing I'd like to teach, and I started at Eastside in 2016, and at that time it was Google Classroom training and a lot of Google Suite training. And I was when I first got there, I mean, we're we're pretty blessed. We don't all have touch screens, but we get a fair, you know, we get pretty good technology, and we get, we've had pretty good training in PD sport. Um, so, so but it takes time. There. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jose. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Michael. That was my basic thought. And the other thing too is, you know, you said to go off to different conferences and learn about different tools. I mean, even with some of our recent trainings, even in Padlet or in other things, they're they're quite impressed. They enjoy it during the training, and then they don't implement. It. And some that I've talked to that they get back to the room and you're alone and you start to forget things. Others, maybe just back to the old habits. <laughs> Not you back to the old habits. All right. Thank you for this uh, great discussion and everyone in the chat as well. Um, we're going to take it to Michelle next, who uh, is the ESL Your chair. Put her on the board. So right. There we go. Oh, there you are. Better, yeah. All righty, okay. Michelle, when you're ready. I'm ready. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle, uh, one of the triple M. <laughs> and um, I am ESL uh, curriculum chair uh, from Eastside Adult Ed. Um, so I'm glad that I have the opportunity to uh, share um, uh, and then uh, introduce our program. Um, so um, I just, the first slide I have here is um, to show you um, the active students we have uh, for our program. So uh, you can see from the blue bars, uh, we have five uh, different departments, ESL, ABE, high school diploma, CTE, and HSE, which is uh, GED. Um, so from the size of the bars, you can see that ESL uh, is the largest portion of our um, Whole program. So up to now, so this is uh, for school year uh, 2022 to 2023. Um, so up to now, because uh, we're still um, enrolling students, um, so we have up to almost 3,000 ESL students up to now, and then it, we're still getting more students. Um, <clears throat> so I'm in charge of ESL curriculum. Um, so uh, we are uh, trying to uh, teach our students uh, digital literacy. Uh, but, you know, from uh, Maricel's presentation, you can see we got some barriers from the teachers because they have a uh, negative attitude toward uh, digital, uh, teaching digital literacy to our students. Um, Maricel, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. All right, so this is just the number of the active students. So for ESL, we have uh, 2,700 students uh, comparing to um, the students in other departments. Okay, uh, next one, please. All right, so this is uh, ESL student levels, okay? Um, so you can see from the sizes of the bars, uh, most of the students in our ESL departments are in beginning low, beginning high, and intermediate low. Okay, so the majority of the students are in these three levels, and which means they are low in literacy, English um, proficiency. Um, also, um, many of them are low in digital literacy levels. All right, so next slide, please. All right, so this is just the, uh, the number from the previous slide. Um, so this is the number of classes, number of classes for ESL department. Um, so you can see the, the most of the number, we have the highest number in uh, beginning high and then beginning low and intermediate low. Okay, next slide, please. All right, and this is, is to show you that uh, we, currently uh, most of our students are uh, attending in-person classes, but we're trying to um, uh, introduce Canvas as a tool uh, to learn um, to our ESL students. So currently uh, for a regular ESL classes, uh, we have uh, about five uh, classes are using Canvas, okay? Um, versus the all in-person 
uh, ESL classes. So uh, the all in-person regular classes is up, it's like about th 39 classes. And then uh, we have only five classes are using Canvas to teach in classroom now. And then we have uh, distance learning and the distance learning is taught by Michael. And then uh, he is using Canvas, so that's 100%. And then we have remote learning um, classes. So, uh, so far we have three uh, remote learning classes and the teachers are not using Canvas. They are simply using Zoom to teach uh, with um, uh, the eBooks uh, we provided them. So um, not, they are not using any uh, learning management system to teach, only uh, use Zoom. And then we have one ESL computer literacy class and it's in person. Um, and the schedule for this class is in the afternoon um, where there are most of our classes are in the morning and evening. So uh, this class, this ESL computer literacy class is in the afternoon. Uh, so they, um, uh, the student can drop in uh, anytime when they have, uh, when they need help. Uh, so the teacher is, uh, teaching in the lab and then uh, and in person only. Um, so from this from, from this graph, uh, I think you can see that um, there's a, a large room of improvement for our program. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we are trying, we're providing uh, trainings and PD to our teachers. Uh, so uh, we're trying very hard to teach our uh, teachers how to use Canvas. And Michael is uh, the lead trainer. So he spent a lot of time and to help our teachers. Um, we also, when, so feel free to stop me if you have any yeah, questions. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, when did you start uh, teaching people how to use, uh, teaching teachers to use Canvas? Uh, start? Like a, we started like a few years ago, right, Michael? Do you remember? When did we start the training? 21. Yeah. yeah. 2021, okay. Yeah. 21, okay, so it's been like two years. And we had been gotten a lot of training going back to at least 2016 when I started in Google Classroom. But specifically Canvas, it was 2021. Yeah. But I like think we, interesting that it's that where you're on your second year, yes? And mm -hmm. uh, only five, right? Only five are teaching in Canvas. Right, only five are actively using Canvas yeah, in their classroom, yeah. yes. Well, that's, that's just an ESL. I mean, I think we, yeah, no. we can push our numbers close to double digits. I think if we, uh, <laughs> if we include take a deeper school. dive, I could bring up the analytics. So it's not quite that low, but it, yeah, it's significant. It's higher, this, in, it's higher in other subject areas? Is that what you're saying? Not really higher, no. no. <laughs> well, one of the things that, uh, one of, I would say issues, but one of the patterns that we've noticed is that um, teachers will attend the training, will start their Canvas shells, and then their Canvas, Canvas shells remain empty for a semester or two. They love the training. They're available on Friday afternoons. <laughs> they're, they're, they're there's an extra duty sheet, yeah, but, yeah. but there's been trouble with it. Yeah, stick. So, uh, so my question is, uh, for example, in the first the first group, the regular ESL, these are in-person ESL courses, and like what percentage of Canvas for the five that are using Canvas is that something that will like every day you know they'll have their students refer or go to the website, but it, it's really there to supplement and or enhance their in-person training. Um, well, there's four or five of us in ESL alone who use it a lot. I don't use it every day. I'm not entirely sure how the other, other teachers do it. I mean, ESL in some ways I think is a little bit easier because, of, for instance, right now with Ventures is our textbook series and they made a whole bundle of shells. And so for, with some of the teachers, I've been helping them to implement that. Um, others work largely in tandem with their, with their textbook and they use it fairly regularly. I mean, there's one who does all the reinvents the wheel and he creates his own classroom and uses it regularly. Mm -hmm. So it's we're in the computer lab once a, once a week. Um, you know, I use it in the computer lab. I use it sometimes on the on. The, we also have Chrome parts. Everyone has Chrome parts. So I, I don't know exactly how everyone else is using it, but 
there's four or five who do use it robustly. Okay. And um, do you know why the remote learning cohort has well, they are using Zoom. For Canvas? <laughs> well, I know one of the teachers does have a Canvas. He's had a Canvas shell for a while. Um, I mean, it seemed like we'd go together a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot. A lot. <laughs> it, it might actually be the first both... place you want to focus on because they really need to be moving it, right? Yeah. For the, the, they're mixed level courses. Stuff. I mean, two of the teachers, this is not meant to be a, an age bias, but they're both retired. One is going to be retiring for good. Uh, it's technology. I, it's technology. I, I, no, I'm not saying that, but <laughs> I, we have to recognize that some some of them, sometimes it's, it's, it's a, they figure, you know, they I've been doing this for 35 years. It works. I'm going to keep going with it. And I think we can give them that. credit that they are doing it on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, and that's helping to, I mean, that's the integrating technology and it's also allowing the students to be at a distance. Mm -hmm. um, so my it's question a step is in the right also, direction. Like what happened during the 100% online uh, period uh, during the pandemic where 100% of your, I assume, of your classes have to be online? What, what did the people do? Well, the first thing people did was retire. Okay. Uh, again, some people do use um, Google Classroom, and that's part of the resistance with, with some of them. I mean, not everyone uses it. Some of them say, listen, I want to stick with that, including, for instance, our department chair in CTE. Uh, yeah. And, and a couple of other department chairs, frankly, who are still holding on to the Google Suite. And I think, I mean, that's a question, too, for you guys is, you know, well, if they're comfortable with that, why not stick with it if it works? Yeah. Um, one of the things that we did was um, attended the online faculty certification for Canvas mm -hmm. to learn about Canvas. That was one of the things, our first step, we needed to learn about Canvas yeah. before um, engaging our students with it. Right. right. Was that, we, we, we've, we've done, we, it was called, the one we used was growing with Canvas. It was instructors, pre-made modules. Yeah. Yes. And a lot of people finished finished it. Yeah. But then they don't get in and play around with it. Yeah. Um, they kind of leave it at that. And then maybe some of the lessons slip. They don't go back in. And that's where I think that a little bit more support to help. Yeah. I'm in. I think because I, I did the growing too. And I'm I'm also uh I know that we have to go to Canvas, but the next step is to actually apply, right? To to do hands-on and I think support on that end would be nice, not because the other one is is just the beginning, the introduction to Canvas, right? But what you need is actual help. You know, it just seems to me that they need to make another section, perhaps of Canvas, where you start putting in your pieces. I don't know, you know, just where we're doing more more directly related to what whatever your subject is that you're teaching. Yeah, I totally agree with Patricia. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, even though we provide training to our teachers, uh, you know, not only to not only Canvas, we also provide training uh, on Burlington English yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Ventures Learning Management System to our teachers. But I think the teacher, even though they, they learn how to use these tools, but uh, the, the barrier they have is from the, the students. So just like I mentioned, most of our students Definitely. are in lower level. Definitely. Yeah. Most of the students are low, like more than our students, more than half of the of the students are in lower levels. So they have very low uh, digital literacy skills. So even though our our teachers know how to use these tools, but not our students. Do you, ha is there a training? Did Canvas make a training for students? Not yet, not well, yet. That's, so I, then I think that that's uh, also an area that's lacking because I already think if teachers are having trouble, Obviously, students, just like you said, are going to have trouble, and so right. people need to address both, making sure that we we perform these. Uh, you know that we've had this presentation, but we have to now insert our 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 class, our right. curriculum into that, and so, we have to get across to the students. And I wonder if that couldn't work at the same time that while students are doing, you know, because often when you're I'm just thinking uh, they might, I, I don't know, but it, it because uh, people have to address, it's not going to go forward if we don't address 
the adult school students. And that's the big thing. I mean, our community colleges want us to go and that would make it so much better for our adult school students. But, you know, we have to climb that hill first. Right, right. I totally agree with Patricia. I think that's a great feedback. Um, so, you know, one of, one of the things that I would like to do is I want to um, uh, let our teacher to teach computer literacy. Instead of having a, a separate class, uh, like the, the one we have right now in the afternoon, um, let our regular ESL teacher to teach digital literacy to our students to help them uh, learn how to use the computer before they can use any of the tools that we introduce them. Yeah. So that is one of my plans for the future. Good idea. All right. So Maricel, can I go to, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, there's a, there's a one comment from Jose who says that uh, his agency uses Google Classroom. All the resources, instructions, and links are housed there. Although the classes are in person now, they still use it to house everything that will happen in class. Uh, this works well with CDP. Since students now have the option to see and catch up with the content, even when they are absent. So that's what, one what, great thing. What's CDP? Yeah, what's C, uh, Jose, what is CDP? Hello, everyone. Um, it's a high school completion. Uh, they Students will take classes and they get credit for each class, like at a high school, but it's for adults. California Diploma Program. Oh, California Diploma Program. Like yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jose. Yeah. Jose, what school are you, are, are you at? Or what program are you with? We're in Connecticut. <laughs> Check, well, <hello>. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Very far away. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. It was a short drive, surprisingly. <laughs> Great. Uh, Maricel, I just want to remind you, can you ask the host to uh, save all the chats? So we can have um, the um, information saved. Yeah. I don't know if I actually have control over that. I think it's all controlled by OTAN. Hopefully, they're, I think they're doing it. I think they're recording it. But they're not, the, the recording, unfortunately, has got to be accessible and it's a big deal and it's probably not going to be available. Got it. So but, the, yeah. It may not be possible. So, uh, Michelle, I would say if you can save the chat yourself, that would be the save best it, way. Save it. Good point. I don't have, I, I cannot save anything from my yeah. hand. Yeah. So, so we'll I think it's an OTAN thing. I do recall, uh, just for your information, in a previous session, after I stopped the recording, there, a little pop-up came up that showed that the chat, I think, was being saved. But that may be something that you would want to contact OTAN okay. Just to verify if the best important issue. Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I see the option on my end on the on the chat. Um, like next to the send button, there's three dots. And when you click on it, it says save chat. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michelle, you're in charge of saving the chat. There you go. Oh, I got it. I got it. Save chat. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Sure. All right, so this is just the, the numbers that you can see from the previous slide, All right? So uh, this is just to let you know that we have regular, 39 regular ESL classes and only and only five Canvas classes, All right? That's it. Okay, and next slide, please. Okay, so uh, these are some uh, text survey questions, uh, results from our ESL students uh, that we did last semester in fall 2022. So these are just some of the questions that I would like to show you. Um, so um, the first question, have you ever taken a class online? So 70% uh, of students say no. So that means that they didn't study during the pandemic. Right. Uh, no, that was just the uh, last semester. So when we came back from um, pandemic. No, but it, if they haven't studied, uh, the question is re asking about just the last semester or last semester. Right. So these students, if they are returning students, they might uh, took the, the Zoom class during the pandemic. But still, we have 70 percent of students say no, they never taken the class online. And that's your assumption that they're brand new students, that they didn't study during the pandemic. Right. That, right. That right. OK. And next question, do you think you can learn online right now? 
62% say no. <laughs> yeah. Do you need a device to help you study online? Okay, close to 60% say no. No, they don't need device. That means they have they are ready, but they don't want they are not, they think they cannot learn online right now. So that's kind of interesting. A disconnect, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, next question. Do you need help getting into the online textbooks or resources? All right, so we have uh, uh, 66, close to 64% of students say, no, they don't need help getting into the online textbooks. But they say they are not ready to learn online. They don't want to. Okay. Um, so, you know, I think these numbers are kind of uh, uh, pretty interesting. And then uh, it's probably because the way we ask them uh, the questions because they are ESL students. So probably they didn't understand the question. So maybe next time when we do the survey, we can um, recreate the question with more pictures to make them uh, more comprehensible so that they can give um, some of uh, the, the true answers. All right, next question. Sorry, is there a question? Barry has a question. Have, have you considered, I mean, for a survey, even though it's for ESL students, and especially for ESL students, uh, why don't you do it bilingually? Right, right. Maybe we can have some translation mm -hmm. next time and add okay. some pictures. I mean, I got to say, a 72% 70, of students saying they don't need any technical help, that's probably a higher percentage than if you were to uh, survey your teachers. <laughs> right, right. Right. <laughs> All right, and the last question, do you need flexible study times? So we have like, like about half and half of students. Okay, so um, I think this is, um, this gives us some work to do from the last question. So they need, they do need flexible study times. So I think it's, uh, there's a need for, um, for teachers to use um, some tools to, to teach online to give our students more flexibility and also give teachers some flexibility. Um, so, um, so, you know, probably we can show the survey to our teachers to let them know that, hey, our students want to uh, have some uh, flexibility. So, you know, probably you should start thinking about, um, you know, using some other tools instead of the traditional uh, in-person uh, classroom teaching. So, you know, use this to motivate them to, um, to start using uh, some new tools. Okay. All right, uh, next slide, please. I think that's uh, my last one. Yeah, just a 15 I'll just, minutes. I'll just go over it quickly and, and I'll have I'll leave some time for Michael. So this is just uh, uh, the WASC, um, our, our WASC action plan for our school. So we do uh, want to um, increase um, uh, successes uh, for our students with low level of digital literacy. And the students, our students should be provided with more computer classes and training in how to use them. The inclusion of technology instruction and learning should be an integral component of all courses. Yeah. And digital literacy enhances the student's ability to perform 21st century basic life skills. Students will be better equipped to be successful in school, work, and daily living. All right, so this is uh, our action plan. So, and then we are uh, making us a goal in our curriculum and then we want to uh, encourage our teachers and students to use more technology. And then um, in order for them uh, to get ready for, uh, for, the, for the world <laughs> and then uh, to be successful. Uh, yeah, that's it from my part. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Michael, did you want to go back to the questions at the very end? Um, yeah, yeah. That and then have our activity of Mike's top 10. So uh, this is, these are our questions that we showed at the very beginning that we definitely need help with. Um, so the first one is what engages you about technology? How do we motivate and encourage teachers to use technology? How do you address resistant teachers? What type of models are you using to provide PD or professional development in technology? How do you support instructors in involving students with technology? How do you prevent technology burnout? And how do we redefine the role of teaching with technology? There's a check. Oh, check. 
Um, can we get the link with the resources? Uh, there is one link at the end, and yeah, we'll put it up and you get the QR code, but that's just a lot of my random perusals. But yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. We'll, you'll get that again. I think that um, you have some of those statistics that will help you. For example, that one at the very end that was in that last survey where it said 50%, basically 50% of the students would like to have more flexibility in learning. Yeah. And one of the things that technology can do is to provide that flexibility because students can access things even though they can't come to school. So I think that could be like a talking point, you know, making sure your faculty realizes that so many of your students want that flexibility. And if they can provide that through technology, their attendance goes up, their persistence goes up, you know, things that are important to teachers and administrators will go up if they can start to incorporate some of the techniques that allow for flexibility and you have the statistics there uh, to back you up. And then that whole thing about, you know, maybe teachers are resistant because they think that students can do this, but it, according to your survey, a very large number of your students feel like they can do it. <laughs> and again, you know, the data may be flawed because of the way the survey was conducted or, you know, student resistance to admit that they don't know something, right. you know, so there are a lot of things in there, but even so, it does sort of show that students, even though they don't, maybe they don't want to take online courses per se, they may be capable of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I definitely want the flexibility. Yeah. yeah. I, there's sure. what I think right now that you said that it reminded me that maybe there's one question missing from that survey. And that is what is the what are the ages of your students or the age range of your students? If you tend to lean more toward middle, the middle of the age spectrum, and you know, Each middle of the age, age spectrum for adult education yourself. is you know 150 years is you know, you know, the top end, you know. But, um, you know, if because I've seen sometimes where there's a younger population in the class, they, they're they the ones who are helping the teacher out with the the, the tech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just yes. out of curiosity, I would say if it's not important, important, but that'd be a... No, I think that's all really interesting. I mean, one thing about the numbers is that the, that data was just from ESL. Uh -huh. So we also have uh, high school diploma has a robust online program we we do we still i mean i i only know of two to three teachers who are actively using canvas after training and one of them is me <laughs> so. but canvas aside i mean ingenuity i mean we use other platforms to give them the, the flexibility to study from home right but then you do have the population of younger students who might seem like they should be helping the teachers right but I have a, a 17 year old, 17 and a half year old, who has never owned a computer, has never touched a computer, is barely learning how to type on a laptop, a Chromebook. So um, the age and the skill levels are everywhere. Yeah. Definitely. Digital literacy. Digital literacy, yeah. And in ES, I teach advanced low ESL, so comparatively easier than beginning low, beginning high, because there's not so many linguistic barriers. Yeah. Um, but still, and I get a lot of older students, but if we use QR codes mm -hmm. in class, mm -hmm. um, we do like Quizlet Live, we play little games and things. And then also, I do put everyone into Canvas, and then we're also using a QR code. To, I get them to, to bring up the app on their phone, so at least they have the option. Um, and again, this is with, it's a range of students. We get young high flyers just in from Vietnam. They stop with us just for a little while on the way to community college. But then we go to like a lot of, I think the older students in ESL, I think they enjoy that opportunity to get in there. Just the, before we flew down here yesterday, I was talking about how to uh, bookmark. Because with Canvas, what, I mean, these are just fundamental issues. Every day I'm running from computer to computer just to make sure they get the, when they lo log into the internet, just to get the address right. Uh, get, we need a dot, not a comma, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it comes up over and over again. I mean, it tends to improve over the course of the semester. 
Um, anyway, I think that a lot of the, as we get using Canvas, there's a lot of digital skills that are being taught as well. I mean, high school diploma, I mean, again, Canvas is what we're trying, one of the one thing we're trying to use, but there, there's a lot of other ways that we're giving opportunities and, and trying to implement, I think, digital technology. Mm -hmm. Ingenuity. Ingenuity. I used to teach GED. Right. We do have an online program there. Mm -hmm. um, and the teacher's gotten to be pretty good at it. I think it enjoys it. And there's a, there's a big demand. And it's not necessarily just um, technology to use as like a, a learning tool. We also, I, I conduct high flex classes. I think I'm the only one. So. I think so. So I, I'm the only one doing high flex in the classroom where students who are sick that day or ha don't have childcare or don't have transportation can just log into Zoom and they use whatever technology we have, Google Classroom, Canvas, Edgenuity, we'll go and do that, we'll do the class together even though they're at home taking care of someone. So just having that kind of opportunity as well is, is really helpful and having them and go to class through Zoom gives them a little bit more of a challenge because I'm not there looking over their shoulder, telling them, click here, click there. Where, where are you having issues? So they'd have to, in a way, be self-reliant first before going into Zoom. And what I do with my class before I let them uh, have the option of taking Zoom is they would stay with me like for the first or second uh, until the first or second month of the semester. And during that time, I'd help them build up those skills so that once they get onto Zoom, they can be independent. So Google Classroom, Canvas. And then once the second month comes around, I'll put the link, I'll, I'll release the link. And the next thing you know, there's like two people, three people on Zoom the next class. Yeah. Any questions in the chat or for the in-person? No. No new questions. Okay. Okay. How, my question that I'm really curious about is number six. How do you prevent technology burnout? Do you get technology burnout or does... <laughs> do. And how do you prevent that? Or is there no, is there no escaping the burnout? <laughs> For my personal self, I walk away and take a break mm -hmm. when I need to. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good point. It's something that probably a lot of us learned or are neglected to learn during the pandemic to get it walk away. Yeah. Yeah. And the eye, my eyes told me when it was time to walk away, mm -hmm. but not everybody, you know, my older eyes, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Younger eyes might not do that for a person. Well, one thing that um, Michael and I and Michelle are are going through is that our admin or someone has an idea of technology that we can use in class, and they're like, "Try this, try that." Oh, we have this new thing. Oh, Canvas is a new thing, but we just got used to Google Classroom, and now we have Canvas. So the technology burnout is also on like the, the classroom and for, for mm -hmm. teachers as well. Cause you know, we we just got them to agree with using Google Classroom because of the pandemic and they grew comfortable and now we have Canvas. So we we're okay with, you know, Google <laughs> Classroom. But I think I think there's a state, no, I think there's a statement, not I don't know if it's a mandate, but I think that state adult ed wants us and it makes sense if our students we we encourage our students to transfer from the adult school to community college and one of the really big things that's so difficult for them for all of us is to transition to canvas and so i think that's why the state i mean the state didn't pick up class uh, google classroom it picked up canvas because that's what the community college is using and it just makes sense to me that what we want to we always want to help our students transition that's the hope that they don't stop at the adult at the adult school that they continue on and to help that to facilitate that is to give them the tools in uh, you know so that they can use canvas and i think there's a push for all of us in adult ed to make this transition it's slow because here i'm asking you that you started in 2021 we're in 2023 
And there's right? still a lot of resistance. And, you know, it's something that we have to work on. Absolutely. Patricia, what school are you at? I'm at uh, Santa Monica, Malibu. It's really small. You, you, <laughs> you say that again? <laughs> I'm sorry, say that again? It sounds like a nice place to be teaching in the adult <laughs> world. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, and you know, I have to say that I, I didn't know that I could do online and certainly the pandemic moved me that way. Uh, and I appreciate that in the sense that, you know, I, my concept was, oh, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And when push comes to shove, you certainly can. <laughs> and there are benefits. I, in fact, I, I had asked because I believe I firmly believe that really high flex is where because I think we need to give our students the option. I had students in during the pandemic who would attend. They would uh, be in the parking lot uh, while their their son or daughter was doing football, uh, soccer practice, right? And that's an amazing thing that they could practice wherever. In other words, they could attend. They were fully, par fully participating students. They did well. They all passed. I teach citizenship, so they all passed their citizenship interview. That's the key. That's the assessment there. But, uh, and so I, I definitely think that uh, high flex is important because it gives just like uh, you mentioned before that if people are ill or if there's a child care issue, then that's an option. That's an option where the, the adult doesn't have to lose their class. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I, I had a hard, I, my, my school district was <laughs> not, <laughs> they were not going to go there. Okay. But I believe in theory, I believe that that's where we have to go because you have to make it open. We've learned how to do online. Now we need to make it so that people who prefer to be in person, I have to say that I'm teaching in person. And woo, when I was teaching online, I had a lot of students who were very receptive to all the things we do online. Now that I'm in person, it's this uh, this group is like, oh, they don't even want to do Burlington English. Oh, you know, you spend hours and hours showing them how, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, uh, you just have to go with the students where they are. So, <laughs> right. thank Thanks you, Patricia. Yeah, Patricia, I want to run us through my top ten real fast. Uh, <laughs> like I keep we using the wrong there. wrong button. So, first one, simplify. Make it easy on yourself, on the students. Uh, I, as a Canvas trainer, want to try to make it easier on those who want to implement by streamlining. Justify. I think Barry made a point about looking at the data. I think there's all sorts of reasons that we can try to show them that it's actually worthwhile going through the struggle. Uh, augment and enhance. This comes from a couple of the models, or the justification models like Triple E or the Samer model for why do we want to use it? Well, it's because we can do things better. Okay. Curate and iterate. Curate, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's lots mm -hmm. of uh, there's a lot of good material already made, particularly in ESL. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to make all of your own and quizzes right from the start. Iterate, you know, I've done it for a number of semesters now and it's different every time. I take what works and drop the rest, uh, in theory. Fail and learn, you know, I make mistakes all the time and I think that's essential. There was a, a triple E course that Deb Jensen did and that was every week we were sharing uh, different technical fails that we'd had in yeah. class. And it's good to hear what, you know, everyone else's failures, but uh, there's nothing like that as a, as a means to learn things. And then be patient. You know, it's going to take time for people and don't dictate. You may want to push them in certain directions, but you don't want to force people and you'll end up with resentment. So it's been fun. These are the resources. Uh, if you're there, still there, uh, Mr. Adorno. I love your last name. <laughs> and thank you guys for helping us with our project. We really, 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 really appreciate it. <laughs> The chat does get saved with the recording, yes. But it does. Be available All right, awesome. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.